turns out in our study that you can, you can almost describe the history of most in industries through a, let of, a set of concentric circles where the people in the middle are the customers in the industry who have the most money and a lot of skill. And the folks at the periphery are folks like you and me that don't have much money or much skill. <laughs> and almost always, at the very beginning, the problems are conf confronted and resolved where we live. Uh, and I'll just walk you through how this happened in the computing industry, just as a way to visualize it, and then we'll move towards healthcare. But when I was in college, if I needed to compute, I just whipped out my slide rule, which I took, took with me everywhere, did the estimation, got on, wrote down the answer, and then got on with life. Well, in that industry, as in most industries, the advent of sophisticated new technology drives a centralization of the industry because the first products are so expensive and complicated that it takes a lot of money and a lot of skill to have it and use it. Now, in the case of computing, it was what we called the mainframe industry, and these mainframe computers would have filled this whole room, cost several million dollars to buy it, and it took years to be, uh, to be trained to operate these machines. So only the largest corporations and the largest universities could have one. And that meant that we had to take our problem to the solution where people with expertise and the equipment could solve the problem for us. But then just the very nuisance and cost of always taking our problem to the solution initiated a, a reciprocal process of decentralization. Again, in this industry, but this is com common in most. And so the first step was, was a product that we called a mini computer. And the younger generation just don't remember what these are. But these were about the size of a cabinet, cost $200,000 instead of $2 million. But they made it so affordable and simple that a whole new population of people, primarily engineers, could now have one of these in their department. And at the beginning, these mini computers could only do the simplest of things. They still had to take the complicated problems to the mainframe center for the experts to do it for us. But then this mini computer as a platform just got better and better and better. Little by little, you can do more and more on this product and didn't need to go there as often. Then the next step was the personal computer. And that PC made it so much more affordable and simple that even a poor fool like Clayton Christensen could own a computer and use it. And if you remember, at the beginning, we could just do the simplest of things on that ma machine, like spreadsheets and, and, and uh, writing. And we still had to take the complicated ones to the mainframe or the, the, the mini computer. But then this platform just got better and better and better so that we, can, we, we were able to do more and more of our problems on this machine and didn't need these nearly as much until ultimately you didn't need mainframes anymore and then you didn't need mini computers anymore. Then the next step was our laptop, which at the beginning could just do the simplest of things. And then that thing became so much more capable that most of us don't require this in our lives anymore. And then the, the smartphone is doing the same thing to the laptop. And a lot of people who, who travel find that the BlackBerry or the iPhone is good enough. They don't, they don't need to take their laptop with them. And so it's interesting, isn't it, that the ability to compute has ended up where it began, except the technology didn't go there in a straight line, but rather this process of, because of this complexity and, and the cost, originally drove a centralization which, was, which then initiated a process of decentralization. So I'll put on the vertical axis the performance of a product or service over time. And there are two elements of this model. The first is that in every market there is a trajectory of performance improvement that customers are able to utilize. Now there's a distribution in every market, so at the high end, very demanding customers who have really complicated problems. 
the low end, simple people with simple problems. These people will never be satisfied with the best you can give them, and these people can be oversatisfied with very little. But that's the first element of the model, is in every market there is a trajectory of improvement that customers can use. Now the second element is in every market there's a different trajectory of improvement that innovating companies provide as they keep introducing better and better products. The most important finding about this is that this trajectory of technological performance in, in almost every industry outstrips the ability of customers to use the importance uh, improvement. Now, some of the companies or some of the innovation, innovations that help a company up that trajectory are just incremental year to year improvements. Others of them are dramatic breakthroughs. But it turns out that the incremental and the breakthrough actually have the same purpose. In, in that what the innovators are trying to do is to sustain this trajectory of performance improvement that exists in the market where they compete. Uh, for example, in uh, healthcare, for years and years, the only way that you could look inside of a body was with x-rays. And the x-ray uh, equipment was made by uh, General Electric, Siemens, and Philips. Then, Starting in the 1970s, CAT scan technology emerged, and then MRI technology, and then PET scanning technology emerged. Each one of them rem rem remarkably um, a, a breakthrough improvement in their capability to look inside the body. Everyone very different technology than the last ones. But you look who are the industries in imaging today, it's General Electric. Siemens and Philips. Because even though they were dramatic breakthroughs, because that helped those folks make better products that they could sell for better profits to their best customers, they figured out how to get it done. But there's another type of innovation that we found always killed the leaders, <coughs> and we called this one a disruptive technology. We use the word disruptive not because it's a breakthrough improvement, but Instead of tr trying to sustain that trajectory, it disrupted it by bringing to the market a product that was just a lot more simple and affordable. It could not be used um, in competition against these people, but through affordability and simplicity, it, it enabled them to, to, bring, to sell the product or service to a whole new set of customers who previously didn't have the money to play here. Now, just an observation that I never thought about before. But we, we um, are just bothered in the, the, at the cost of health care going up at 6 to 10% per year. And we figured out, I think, why this works. And that is that the, the effect and the intent of innovations to move up this trajectory is to be able to, to sell higher and higher products and services because that's the way they, we make money. And, uh, and when I say the intent is to move up that trajectory, if you are, as an innovator are trying to improve your, pro your top and bottom line, always it's, it's facilitated if you make better products that can be sold for better profits to your best customers. And so, in, in the, in the, as, as the consequence of that, the rate of inflation on the trajectory of sustaining innovation is about 8 to 10 percent per year. It's disruptive innovation that drives decentralization that reduces cost. And so, because we haven't had much disruption in healthcare or higher ed, um, the costs are moving up at 8 to 10 percent per year. In other industries like computing, where there's been a lot of this, this uh, overcomes the effect of that, and so overall costs are going down. Now, uh, when I was a little guy, uh, if something went wrong, our doctor uh, made uh, house calls. And so the problem came to the solution. 
But the advent of sophisticated technology then drove a centralization of the industry. And the cost of <coughs> surgical suites and, and imaging equipment and, and testing equipment was so expensive that we then had to bring our problem to the solution. But rather what we have to do is we need to bring technology to doctor, to outpatient clinics so that we can begin doing more and more of the things which today require the full, full fate of a hospital. And then we need to bring technology to doctor's offices and ultimately to patients' homes so that we could be do doing there the simplest of the things that today have to be done in an outpatient clinic. And then we have to just drive technology over and over into these venues of care so that they can do more and more and more of the things that previously requir required uh, more expensive facilities into things that are lower in cost. So in other words, rather than um, what we need to do to make healthcare affordable and simple is uh, um, to bring technology to lower cost venues of care and lower cost caregivers to do, to do progressively more sophisticated things. That's the way we make healthcare affordable and accessible, not by somehow expecting that the expensive ones will become cheap. Now, in, in any innovation, when you have this opportunity to disrupt, there are three elements, and I'd like to just go through those as best I can. The first cell element is a simplifying technology, and I'll explain on the next slide what I mean by that. But it essentially enables somebody who doesn't have as much training actually to solve very effectively the industry's fundamental technological problem. And then that technology has to be embedded in a business model, a new business model that can uh, cost-effectively take this simple solution to the customer. And that then has to be embedded in what we call a value network, which is the uh, industry around this new innovation. Our, our body has been given a very limited vocabulary that it can draw upon when the body has to say that something has gone wrong inside. And, and the, the vocabulary of our bodies are symptoms. And the problem is that there just aren't nearly enough symptoms to go around for all the diseases that exist. And what that means then is that the diseases had to get together and agree to share uh, the symptoms. And that's the problem. But because you just don't know whether the therapy will work or not, when you only can diagnose by the symptom rather than understanding the root cause, care has to be given in what we call intuitive medicine, which is the equivalent of what DuPont scientists had to play in, uh, where we just by trial and error try to work towards something that works. But as these folks have practiced their craft, little by little, patterns begin to emerge and it moves uh, health care into a realm that we have chosen to call empirical medicine, where just as in, in the DuPont world, um, there's no cookbook yet, but there are patterns that now en enables you to, to, make, to take things or uh, express things in probabilistic terms. So uh, in, in addition to my having a uh, stroke in this last year, I also was diagnosed with cancer, uh, and a uh, lymphoma that's called fo follicular lymphoma. And I go to, I think, one of the best physicians in the world in that realm, and he can say, um, you know, we're gonna, we've got three options for treating your, your type of lymphoma. And if we do this, the probability of an outcome is that. And so we call it empirical medicine because 
assertion, assertions like that reply to a pro, uh, population, and we can express the outcome probabilistically. But there's, he is not able to tell me at this point what particular therapy will um, be most effective for Clayton M. Christensen. And, uh, and a lot of medicine have, have sh shifted from this to that, which means that you don't have to be the very best in the world to play in that game because the patterns are so clear. Ultimately, as we can come to understood what causes the disease, not by uh, looking at the, the uh, symptom, we, the, it moves into a realm that we call precision medicine. And that is because you can understand what causes the disease, then it gives you the opportunity to develop a, theory, uh, a, a therapy that is predictably successful in solving that problem. And when you move in that world, um, just like you then over, had, you had software and you just had to have a BS in chem -E from an average state school, now a uh, nurse practitioner and a physician's assistant following the rules can actually provide better care at lower cost than could the world's experts a generation or two ago when the, the disease was in the realm of intuition. And so that's the, in, in my prior slide I described how the uh, a, a simplifying technology is the first step in transforming uh, uh, an industry from one who, whose processes and products are so expensive and complicated that only the world's best and only the world's richest have access into something that is much more affordable and accessible. Mm -hmm.